air. The stream is reigniting itself. Uh, and this is all seems to be working fine. It seems like what happened was the system froze itself up. And uh, uh, that could be because maybe I can't, I can't, you know, I can't do both at the same time. Last night it worked perfectly. And tonight, oh, I got enough, enough uh, bandwidth and everything, but who knows what the, what the problem is. Anyway, let's get back to uh, our panel. Uh, by the way, Bob uh, Eberth is in uh, Salt Lake City. Josh Wheeler is in, God, I always, Ohio. Is that enough? It's a whole box. Uh, Charlene is in yeah, New is, Jersey. Where's the sausage? What? Well, oh, oh, hold on a second. I got to turn this on. Uh, Sorry. Uh, was that you? It may have been yeah, me. I was yeah. trying to play with both the um, uh, Skype feed and the live stream yeah. feed. It may have been me. I apologize. Well, this thing this thing seems to be working now, but if it doesn't uh, continue to work, uh, I will uh, give up. And, and uh, yeah, I, we'll, we'll... I got you back on the live stream, okay? Yeah. So uh, Well, I got the ad on live stream, and that was the music you heard. Yeah. may have heard. Yeah, I don't know. When they run the ad, did you notice this, that even if you have your uh, thing on uh, on the mute uh, for K okay, for the speaker, when the commercial comes on, the sound plays. <laughs> well, I didn't even get a chance it, it, to it, it, it's find the, mute. <laughs> it's the ultimate annoyance. And they run a commercial before the video begins, and yet if you go to their site, they say no ads. And I wonder what that what's what's that about? No pop up ads. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me see here. Mark, how's it going? Uh, you look good now. How, how's it going down in uh, there's Mark? Uh, uh, spent the day dealing with uh, lighting issues. Mm -hmm. all, all, all my my old lighting equipment is I'm about to kick it out and uh, find portable lighting. So for photography. Yeah. Yeah. I had like these old, good old lights that lasted me for about 20 years. And Do you uh, ever notice, and, and I don't know if anybody else notices this, when you're talking about things like equipment, that all of a sudden it, 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 it the equipment breaking down happens, seems, happens all at once. It's like all of a sudden one thing breaks and then another thing breaks and another thing breaks. And it's like you can't touch anything without it breaking. And then you finally get it all fixed and right, and then it doesn't happen for a couple of years. But then all of a sudden, one day, you wake up, and that's not working, and that stops working, and you can't figure out why that isn't working. You know. You have no answer. I wish I did. <laughs> you know? It might be the domino effect. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that's it for me. I hope that's OK. I don't need any more surprises. <laughs> yeah. William? I'm just frustrated with my own internet, so I'm going to apologize in advance if I disappear because I've been logging my knockoffs for the last hour. So, Oh, really? It's, it, I want to be here. I want to be part of the citizen, citizen panel, but I've been logged off one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times for at least five minutes since uh, this show started. And can we ask who is your su your supplier? Dish and Windstream. Oh, 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 there's your problem. It probably is, and they're going to be getting a call from me, but I'm unfortunately I'm in the mi middle of my busy season, but I'm keeping track of it so that I yeah. can at least have a drama queen moment with them. By the way, for people, for people who are listening to us for the first time tonight, uh, just be, know, be it known that we sometimes have no problems at all, you know? And then there are nights where we have problems. But this is not a perfect system, and this is something we're still working out. But for the most part, you know, I may, I'm only going to do the TV once a week because to go through this, you know, I think I've got it down and we'll just do it once a week and, and let people see, you know, look in on the show. Uh, and, and we'll do it on and, Friday nights. And the problems I'm having with Skype and with this connection are not yours. They're my end. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Some other corporate provider. I just just forgive me when I just suddenly disappear. That's all I'm saying. Uh, well, or asking. <laughs> Please. You know, 
it's it's a real it's a real problem that, that we have with technology. You know, I I've said this before, and I will say it again. Years ago, uh, Revelstoke Jim and I were involved in a project called Play TV, and uh, one of the reasons why it failed was well, there was the dot com blowout, which uh, w w helped a great deal in in ruining us, but also it was because the technology wasn't up to what we were doing. What we were doing was trying to put out a 3 kilo, uh, uh, kbps signal, 300 kbps signal video. And we had a lower rate for people who didn't have that kind of speed at home. And, and we tried to do this internet television network. But there were so many problems. There were so many problems with connectivity and with bandwidth and the cost of bandwidth and all of that. And so now here we go, and we're, we're in, the, uh, in the year 2014, and you would figure that it was all solved, that suddenly, you know, it was no problem to send out tons of video and pictures and things like that. And you know something? <laughs> buffering, 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 buffering. All the problems that we were facing back then, some of them they've never solved. The f and this is like... 15, 16 years later. So, you know, it's, it's a pain in the ass. It's a true pain in the ass. The only wonder here is that Max is actually talking to us from Germany. And while we were see, just seeing his picture, last night we actually had a, a, a video of him. Uh, and that's, that's, that's pretty amazing to me. What's also amazing is if I look around our little uh, wheel of who's listening, uh, we got countries like Canada, Japan, Germany, of course, that's you, Max, I can see you, uh, Switzerland, uh, the Bahamas, I see every day India, China, Iraq, Iran. Uh, so that part amazes me, you know, that, the, that we're getting a worldwide audience for something like this. But otherwise, still got buffering, 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 or I have a, a problem here with this program seizing up as it did a few minutes ago uh, and I've got the I've got the uh, headroom here I got 18.45 gigabytes of memory still free and it froze up you know so it may be NSA screwing with us because you have so many countries listening in yeah, yeah could be Rick uh, you know cool huh cool we could start a cool. revolution I, I I wonder well of course I never see any from North Korea so, uh, which I think is a virtual impossibility, I think. Number one, because they wouldn't let our programming in to North Korea. And secondly, they don't have computers. So that's, uh, you know, the problem. Hey, we're joined by Portland reason. Dave. Let me see here. Do we have enough room for Portland Dave? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, we can't. You're the last guy on line with us, uh, Dave, uh, because, you, uh, uh, because you made up ten people. Who are on the citizens panel? A full house, ladies and Sweet. gentlemen. Sweet, <laughs> awesome. How's everything out in Portland? Oh, things are good. A little rainy today, but uh, listening to you talk about the technology, I just wanted to share a story with you. Yeah. Back when I was about fourteen, this was nineteen eighty four. Yeah. My friend and I, we set up a BBS service with our Apple IIe. Do you recall that technology? A BBS service, yes, bulletin board service. Okay. Yeah, it was a dial up. It was basically one computer to one computer. So if your friend was running a BBS and somebody else was on for three hours, you would dial for three straight hours and get a busy <laughs> signal. Well, that was before texting and everything else. Uh, I used to be on a thing that Penn and Teller had. They invited me to join a call. It was a very pr privileged group of people that were allowed to join this thing, and it was called the uh, uh, the Jungle. In fact, I have a wristwatch that still has the Jungle on the back of it that uh, that they sent out to each of us. And we also have Jungle jackets, Penn and Teller Jungle jackets. But the Jungle was exactly that. But it was you know it was kind of like a chat room, but a very slow one. Like somebody would say something, and then you'd sign on and see what people had said and reply to what those people had said, and then they would sign on later and see what you reply. It, it, it was very slow. And uh, one day, I, I said to Penn, I said, have you heard about these things called websites and <laughs> chat rooms? And he said, I don't want to do it. He said, I like 
the jungle the way it is. <laughs> and I went, Pen, it's monotonous. And the next thing I knew, I wasn't on the jungle anymore. <laughs> but I mean, it was just that I went, the technology has gone beyond this. I mean, it was lovely. It was a lovely thing while it lasted. But, you know, now you can just talk directly to people back and forth on a chat room. So. Yeah, no, it was, uh, I mean, just loading programs was just such an, uh, I mean, you'd wait five minutes. You'd yeah. put in your floppy disk. Yeah. And, you know, I played, I don't know if you guys remember these games, Castle Wolfenstein. Yeah. Minor 2049 or yeah. all these different games. And you just had to be so patient with everything. And, but we tried to set up actually what would have been Amazon today. We bought a couple hundred dollar piece of software and we yeah. tried to set up what was going to be what we called a virtual mall. Yeah. But it just was at that point the technology in terms of that we needed one phone line for each computer that would interact with us and we would need one computer. So you were talking back in 1984, $2,500 to $3,000 for a computer and then each phone line which wasn't cheap back then. You want me to take so you back to the we, we we kind of you know fizzled you, you, out on it. What was your fir, what was your first computer? My first computer was an Apple II Plus with 48k of memory. Okay, uh, 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 Rick, what was your first computer? A Dell. I believe it or not, it's only only probably about eight years ago that I, that I had one. Oh well, and we're not even talking in this discussion. Yeah, William. <laughs> Uh, leading Edge or TRS-80. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, Radio Shack, huh? The yeah. I, I, I hung out with my dad. <laughs> did you load the programs via cassette? Yes, I did. Uh, let me see here. Bob, what was your first computer? I used Apple IIe. Okay, that's still good. It's going back there. That's pretty good. <laughs> that's back there. Charlene? Oh, what kind of computer? Yeah. I have an Acer. No, the first computer you ever had. An oh, Acer? Oh, the first one. You still uh, have HP. an Acer? Oh, wait a minute. They do make them, don't they? HP was the first one. Yeah. Uh, HP? Mm -hmm. Okay. Josh? Uh, if I remember correctly, I had a Packard Bell that ran MS-DOS. Okay. Living large. Mark? <laughs> uh, 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 I'm Cy 8080. From oh, 1975. A what? What? I go way back. Um, it was just some, it was nothing more than a board and um, some LEDs and a hex pad on it, basically. That was my first computer. Wow. After that, it was an SR52 from Texas Instruments. Mm. My, uh, my. Max, what was your first computer? The Mac Plus. The Mac Plus. So you see, we're getting... Uh, you're how old, Max? 38. 38. See, the younger you get... The little more recent the computers get. Patrick, first computer. Um, Apple um, LC2. LC2? Yeah. I don't remember that. Uh, they were they were long, <laughs> and um, the the actual uh, computer itself had the monitor sit on top of it, and the monitor was actually the same length as the uh, computer itself. And it was pretty slick looking for the time. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, shit, it didn't do anything yeah. by today's standards. So, so it only were you doing it was, a graphic design back then? Well, that well, that's what I had it for. And the program that I was using, and it was in high school, was uh, I forget the name of it, but it was pixel by pixel drawing. And I remember designing my first logo. And it had the space shuttle in it, and it was pretty damn intricate. And I bet that thing took me 100 hours to do because it was pixel by pixel of color. And then, you know, if you had gradients, you had to actually change the color pixel. Wow. There wasn't any tool that would just make it a gradient. So, um, yeah, it, it, was, yeah. it was quite the... Uh, piece of equipment for the time. My first computer, well, it's strange. I was working with uh, Al Goldstein. I was doing Midnight Blue, and I was at his offices, and he started a magazine called Gadget. And so he only did it as a ruse to be able to have people send him gadgets. And so he got in two things. He got in, and it was the first computer I ever learned how to play, was an Atari 800. Oh, that was a fun computer. Yes. 
It was an Atari 800, but he also had an Apple II. I think it was a two. Maybe it was a 2S or something like that, but it was a two. I couldn't figure out how to use the Apple. It just wasn't that user-friendly at that point. But I could figure out how to at least play games on the Atari. But I also learned that you could kind of do a little computing and stuff like that. So when I moved to California, I bought an Atari 800 as my first computer. And uh, it was on that computer that somebody handed me a, a bootleg of a program that I could use on the Atari. And it was called, uh, what, was the first, what was the first accounting program? Visicalc. Um, Visicalc. And I put it in, and I, I, I had this business manager who was getting cross-eyed from doing spreadsheets. And I had him come over, and I said, look at this. Tell me what this is. And he said, it's a spreadsheet. And I said, well, here, play with it. And he's suddenly realizing he put numbers in, and they would start adding them up as he put them in. And he went, I want a computer. He never had a computer. <laughs> So what we did is we all went out, we put, we bulked our money together and mass bought three IBMs, IBM PCs. Get this, we were living large, two floppy disk drives, <laughs> oh. five inch wow. floppy disk drives. Mm -hmm. Five and a quarter or eight and a half? No, five and a quarter. Five and a quarter. You know, we were living small. And, uh, uh, and we, 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 Hey, I've got two, two, uh, what is that noise? Uh, Sorry. That's my, uh, uh, phone with messages coming through. Oh, I, boy, that, that must drive you nuts. Uh, anyway, um, uh, so, you know, it was just, uh, it was a, the most wonderful thing in the world. And the thing I love best about that IBM PC for its time, very beautifully constructed. It had a real nice shape to it and so on. And uh, then we put in hard drives in it. I had my first hard drive was a 20 megabyte hard drive, and it only cost me $500. <laughs> so th that's how I was graduating. That's how far back I go with playing with computers. I mean, I'm not as far back as some people who were building those kit computers, you know, but or learning how to program them. I needed a program to be able to run on them. But, uh, you know, as time has gone on, I mean, the fact that I've, I'm sitting here in this studio with more computing power than we ever had at NASA to send people to the moon is, is just amazing to me. Uh, and it's not all that expensive, but I still can't go to the moon, so fuck it. You know. <laughs> on the downside, though, <clears throat> people thought more back then. Uh, yes. Uh, I think... You know, of course, you go back to any generation, and the generation before it is always saying, well, you know, life was, isn't as good for you as it was for me because I had the simplicities of life. And, you know, me, I go back and I go, you know, there was a time when we actually phoned each other up and talked to each other. <laughs> now, you know, kids don't realize that, the, you know, and this is what I don't know. Tell me I'm old. Really. Give me, give me the lecture that I turned in to an old fart. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but correct me if I'm wrong, isn't the same device that people are using to send texts where they have to tap out on a keyboard the text, the same device they can use to phone the same number they're sending the text to and actually talk to the person? <laughs> uh, what were we going to say, uh, Rick? Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. I get a lot of technical questions from from uh, distributor sales guys, and they'll call me up and ask something. And I, or actually, what they'll do is they'll text me something or send me an email, and they don't ask give me enough information for me to give them the proper answer. So instead of a two minute phone call, I have to compose War and Peace to ask all the questions that they might need, and it stretches this whole thing out a lot further. Yeah. If they just call, you're done with. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just call my client because I'll get, I'll get crap like that where they'll be asking stuff and it'll be changes they want done on, on something and it, they're very vague. It, it's on p panel two of yeah. page whatever. But aren't we talking here about the desocialization of, of our society? 
that we are not interacting with each other any longer, that somebody would rather send you a text than just get on the phone and phone you and say, hi, how you been? What's happening? Um, and, well, I, uh, you know, I, it, I, find, I find, for instance, I find uh, even email very limiting. I mean, I will... Um, there are some people that are good at emailing, I guess, and getting a thought across in emails, and other people like myself, and uh, I'll even say my pal uh, Albert, I don't think is a great emailer, because he writes so fast, little short snippets, you know, that you don't know, how did he mean that, you know? Mm -hmm. You're trying to suddenly give an emotion to one line, and after a while, you, you begin to have an opinion that isn't even worth, it's paranoid. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna are you gonna say something to, uh, about that? Uh, yeah, uh, I think there's Portland a lot Dave? of hurt, unintended hurt feelings with texting. I have a lot of friends who have issues in terms of one, their texts they feel are misinterpreted, and then two, when they receive texts, they interpret them in a way that the sender never intended, and they read something in there because they're sensitive that was never intended, that if you had a conversation and used the same words, but the intonation in your voice says a lot, and that's what's lacking, and so well, when I mean, people... Yeah. Oh, I was, getting, I was getting a little kind of paranoid about stuff that Albert was writing, uh, you know, but just because he was... He's very terse in his writing, right? Uh, uh, and, and then I call, I said, we gotta talk. Okay, <laughs> and then we talked for two uh, for thirty seconds, and there was no problem. It was just the, hey, the, I was just saying this, and I was just saying that, and sometimes I just got to call him now and then to make sure he still likes me, you know, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> emails are not sufficient to get across what you feel, and texts, forget, forget it, you know, uh, but, what. But this creeps into all parts of life, okay? Yeah. For instance, I had this conversation with Albert. Yeah. This is how we get a job now, too, okay? I, I maintain with Albert the other night that the reason that I can't break out of my career and get into the college teaching career, okay, is not because I don't have the education, because I do. It's not because I'm not smart, because I'm not going to tell you that I'm great or anything, but I think I can do it. The reason is because I made the mistake, apparently, of not going to college right out of high school. I went into the skilled trades, and then I worked my way through college. And now that I have a decade's worth of service in the skilled trades, and I'm putting out these resumes for these quote-unquote professional jobs trying to be a professor, they look at my resume. Okay, they don't look at me. They look at my resume, and they say, oh, look at this guy. Yeah, he's been a mechanic for 10 years. Bzzz, goes right in the shredder. They never even bother to pick well, up the phone I, I'll tell you and give you a call and talk to I'll you. I'll tell you what's even worse in my business, okay, in, in the broadcasting business. Let's say I, I want to talk to somebody at, uh, oh, a radio station here in New York. And I want to talk to them and just present, hey, I'm Alex Bennett. You've probably heard of me. Uh, you know, I'm looking for some work. Have you got me around? And so you go, uh, oh, by the way, there's what Patrick does when he has to go to the bathroom. Uh, and we like that. Back I will be. Wait for me. You will. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, th that when I then say, okay, well, I'll, I'll get a hold of the program director at such and such a station, mm -hmm. you can't find out uh, who the program director is. And if you finally find his name on a list, you can't find his email address <laughs> anywhere. These people mm -hmm. don't want to be contacted. That's yeah. what, you know what? I was trying to find at UCLA. I'm a UCLA alum. Yeah. My dad's a professor there, and I care deeply about this school, but often I see things that are not right, and I try to go find the person whom to contact, and basically, they don't want to be contacted. There are no phone numbers. There are no email addresses, and so I've questioned, well, why is this? And what I've been told is that they've been hounded so many times by alumni and residents that they want to make it as difficult as possible for somebody to find them and uh, yeah, you know be able to share information. So uh, basically, America is disappearing. Yes. So, I mean, that's what I'm saying is I've probably sent out dozens of applications along with my resume that I've had looked at, I've had done professionally, I've done all kinds of things, okay, Yeah. for professional-type jobs, like I said, with college teaching. And... Every single time I get a form email back that says, 
well, we've reviewed your resume and uh, we're going to pursue other applicants at this time. Like I said, I'm convinced that if I could just get a 30 minute, even if I could just get a five minute phone interview with somebody, that would get me in the door for that 30 or 45 minute face to face interview. And then I could sell myself as being able to do the job as teaching. I can't even get the phone interview. So, I mean, do we really want to hire the best people or do we really want to hire the best people on paper? You tell me what you really want. I'm convinced we want to hire the best people on paper because the lazy ass fuckers who do the hiring just that makes their job easier. Well, if you fit into their template. That's it. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and people have to fit into templates to get the jobs today. It, they're not. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's, there's not the personal hiring. You know, today, when you go for a job, where do they send you? Go to HR. Mm -hmm. Interview with HR. I don't want to interview with HR. I want to interview with the guy who potentially might be my boss right. and who I'm going to have to work with. And I got to tell you, it's a two way interview, pal. You know, mm -hmm. I also want to see what he's like because maybe I don't want to work with him. Right. And when it when it when it comes to hiring, especially in professional jobs, just to use academica, you know, as an example, yeah. when you are hired, do you want, like you said, an HR professional doing most of the interviewing and then maybe they sit with the department chair head at the very end? Yeah. Or do you want the person who does the hiring of a professor to be experts in the area? And that's that's not how it's done. And that's only, like I said, if you get your foot in the door which is all done by your resume that goes over the internet. Someone peeks through it. Yeah. In some cases nowadays, they don't even peek through it. It goes through a filtering program that filters out resumes that don't have key words, et cetera. I mean, that is the most ridiculous thing I've, I've, I've ever heard of. And we hire college professors, et cetera, that way. And then we sell these parents on, oh, we have the best professors in the world. Well, no, I you just, just have people I, with I the best-looking uh, yeah, fucking resumes. I just, uh, and I think that America and companies are losing out on some great talent. Yes. Because, because of exactly because of this. You know, they're, they're just not uh, 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 really doing what they should do uh, to uh, find people of, of, of quality. They're losing out on them because, of, uh, uh, because they're just not paying attention. They haven't got their ear to the ground. It's mm -hmm. all just a process. And I and I honestly have to think that some of it goes back to laziness because, like I said, all I'm asking for is, is a small interview. I mean, you've seen me on this show. Mm -hmm. Skype with me, whoever you are, for 20 minutes. Ask me whatever you want. Ask me my thoughts on this period or that period. And you know what? At the end of the day, if you interview me and 20 other people and you told me the other 19 guys were better than I was, I'll take that. My problem has always been... I can't even get the interview. That's yeah. what's so aggravating. Dave, you raised your hand. Oh, I totally agree with you. And uh, I can tell you from my father, who was an executive at Boeing, and he had to recruit engineers. And he said, if you had MIT, Caltech, Berkeley, Stanford on your resume, you'd most likely get the job. And he found... Mm -hmm that the best employees who he hired were from so-called lesser schools, and these people worked harder and were so into this branding. So often you read a business story about an entrepreneur, and they throw out Harvard MBA. Well, what is what does that tell me about the person? And so I agree with Josh. We just it's it's all about this branding, marketing, and status, and really not looking at the individual and whom's really best for a particular position. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's vexing. Uh, uh, Rick? Yeah, in, in addition to, to, to what's going on, yeah, I agree with everything you guys have just said, but the job market makes it even worse because there are mm -hmm. so many people looking for so few jobs, it yeah. compounds the issue. If we ever get the economy up and running again, things should get a little bit better in that regard. Well, if I ran... Harvard there, grads tend to hire Harvard grads, and so yeah, it's yeah. just this self-fulfilling cycle. Then Harvard grads get rich, and rather than donating billions of dollars to help all people get education, they donate the money to Harvard. So it's just this kind of aggregation of wealth and power. And I think that's what's kind of happened in this country is that power and wealth has been aggregated in such few entities. And basically, money's become sticky. This is my theory 
overall theory on stuff is most businesses operate at a very small margin, three to five percent. So I bring in a dollar, 95 cents goes out. I pay my employees, I pay my landlord, I pay my insurance. But then you have other companies like Google or Apple or Facebook who operate at exceedingly high profit margins. When that dollar hits Apple, they hang on to 40 cents of that dollar. And where are they doing? They're parking that money right in treasury bills. So that 40 cents now is stuck in Apple rather than circulating throughout well, one the, of the economy. About, one of the gripes uh, recently about Apple was the fact that Apple uh, uh, was hoarding their money, that they weren't spreading it around. They had more disposable income than most companies in, in, in the country. And because they just weren't spending all this wealth that they were getting, it didn't go out to people. Billions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, So I think this is happening everywhere, though. Endowments, they only have to spend 5% of their money per IRS. So I think what I've seen is every two generations, the money just gets aggregated in too few hands. And basically what's happened is, is that you have your money supply, and then you have the velocity in terms of how many times it's turned over. Mm -hmm. And what's happening in our economy is the money is not turning over very rapidly. And that's why the Fed has been able to flood our economy with dollars and not create rampant inflation because the money's not moving. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a horrible situation. Now, Mark, you're not in the job market, are you, right now? You're pretty retired, aren't you? No, I work. Well, you do work. Yes, I do, Alex. I have to go out and hustle. Yeah, um, but you do photography. Yeah. Um, so, so it's a sell. It's it's a it's your own business. It is. You don't have I to mean, go out and deal with this uh, this incredible amount of oh, what could we call it, bureaucracy that's going on out there. Oh, I still do. Really? You know? in, what, um, in what respect? Um, dealing with the well, I have so and so relative that has a camera. Why should I hire you? Or, uh, well, what kind of photography could... exactly do you hire yourself out to do? For hire, it doesn't make a difference. I can do weddings. I can do arch architectural landscape. Yeah. Uh, boudoir. I, I don't specialize. That's the thing. I come from a different generation. You're a professional photographer. Yeah, exactly. And what is... before that, well, I'll, I'm going to be up in New York soon. And we'll get together. I, I'd love I don't to. want to tell you what I did because... There's some issues. But <laughs> just let, let's just say it, it's a discussion that's going on right now that's very near and dear. Yeah. And I don't want to be barraged with questions about what it was like working there. Oh, okay. All right. What, what platform are you on? Nikon, Canon? Uh, Leica. Leica, oh, you're, you're high, high end. Well, it's you got like, nice gear. Leica is, uh, is, is, is for people who like Leicas, actually. You know? No, it's what I've been shooting since I was exactly. a teenager. Exactly. Oh, Great course, glass on course, those lenses. Oh, my God, of, yes. Of, of course, <laughs> I, I switched from video to... I've switched from stills to video, uh, which I said... I, uh, which I looked at as a succession of still frames. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, uh, I think I, if I were shooting a camera today, I bought two of them for a girlfriend, because she does shoot, or Nikons. Because they're just really good, you know. Although yeah, my Nikon friends tell me, because I'm in the Canon world, I'm so invested in the lenses, it's, I can't make any choice. I mean, change. But all my Nikon friends tell me I'm on the wrong platform. I'm on, a, I'm on the PC of cameras, and Nikon's are the apples. Is that true? Well, I think that's probably true to a certain extent. But I'll tell you right now, in video cameras, um, to begin with, the the best of the major companies to me is Canon. Uh, I have the I've, 5D I've, Mark III, and it's incredible. I've been using their cameras now. I've been, uh, their three-chip cameras now for, oh, I, I gave up on Sony maybe uh, uh, six, seven, eight years ago. But my favorite now is this little dealy, you know? GoPro? Yeah. Out, out, out GoPro. of nowhere, that company came and just took over everything. It's amazing. I, I got to tell you, folks, the only problem with the GoPro is you better buy about 10 batteries to keep with mm -hmm. you because they, <laughs> oh, they, yeah. they eat up the battery power. Uh, but the one thing I want to do, I wish I had the money. Maybe we'll come into some soon because I'm not working right now. Is I want one of those drones. 
Mm-hmm. I want a drone yes. so I can put this on a drone and send it up in the air and, and shoot myself on the ground, you know? But this is this is a incredible camera. And what to their credit, you know, they could have done a lot of things. They could have gone into making like, oh, I don't know, cell phones with GoPro in them and so on. And they haven't done anything else but just sell this little block to people at three ninety nine right. each or two ninety nine for some. And it takes I mean, I gotta tell you, as a broadcaster, it takes broadcast quality pictures. And it's a, it's an amazing camera. So you shoot on 4K on that, and you have croppability down to 1080p. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that doesn't mean a lot to people out there, but that me. Oh, it always means you know whenever people say how many pixels something has, and they say, remember they were selling cameras, and they were saying, oh, we have so many pixels here. The more pixels you have, that simply means that you can crop that picture smaller uh, uh, than you would because you've got a denser. Uh, uh, rate of uh, of quality, uh, but it didn't mean anything else but that, you know. Uh, but it meant you could blow it up and it would look. It's good. amazing. Compare GoPro to the Flip camera, who which I also Cisco had. bought for seven hundred million dollars and then wrote the whole thing off and shut yeah, it down. They, well, yeah, well they, they wanted to buy just the underlying technology. They didn't care about the camera well, part. You know, when I first heard about GoPro, I went, "Isn't that?" Uh, isn't that just you know the flip camera and then i got one and i said this ain't the flip camera no, the, flip. the flip camera was a really slop slip shot idea of how you make a small cheap portable camera the guy who did this was looking for something so he could put it on his head and go skiing and have incredible pictures and i'm telling you it's 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 the best camera for the buck in america no question in my mind about it. But it's a tribute to them that they haven't gone to somebody like Apple. And I'll bet Apple's approached them and said, why don't you put our GoPros in your in your iPhones, which they could do. And uh, But, you know, uh, they haven't done that. They know who they are. They're going to remain what they are. Other people are trying to knock them off and don't come close. Bravo for this company. It's incredible. Only camera I company I know. Nikon. Huh? Sorry. What, what, no, go ahead. I still think Nikon has one of the best cameras out there, only because I've dropped my Nikon. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> even the previous ones, twice or three times for a two-story building. Yeah. I can still pick it up, and it still works. Wow. The glass didn't break in, inside or nope. anything? No? Nothing. It still works. Wow. Less battery life, though. The battery life went down a tiny bit. Yeah. Well, you can't have everything. You drop that thing out of a two-story building, for crying out loud. <laughs> I was drunk. Well, yeah. Uh, uh, Dave? Uh, Well, you know, it's really incredible what's gone on with the technology. I was talking with some filmmakers, and they said, you go back 20 years ago, and it was a very exclusive club in terms of who could make a shoot, have the amount, enough money to shoot on film. Very expensive for the film, developing. Now the technology has become relatively inexpensive. Mm -hmm. What you're able to capture is cinematic for a reasonable amount of money. Mm -hmm. What point is society going to take these tools that are widely available and is better content going to be more widely available? I guess what I'm trying to say is when are we just going to utilize these tools to maximum to take advantage of this new medium in terms of storytelling with video and audio. Well, you know what I find fascinating uh, is uh, what is the, oh, God, I can't try to remember the name of it now, uh, the, the uh, you know, the short form video company where you just do it seven seconds long. What's oh, Vine. Called? Vine. I was thinking Leaf. I was trying to remember what it was. <laughs> uh, I, have, I have seen the most creative stuff done with Vine of any medium that's been presented out there. And simply because people are limited to seven seconds to tell an entire story. And I found some of it absolutely brilliant, you know? So simplicity sometimes, it goes the other way. And, you know, if you think about it, the GoPro simplicity, you could tell a whole story with this. And you got a little editing program and you're in. You're ready to go. Um, You know, I just haven't gone out and done enough shooting with it. I wish I had. 
the time lapse feature in that GoPro is incredible. You can actually take video mm -hmm. and speed it up, and it, it applies a motion blur to the moving subject. I didn't even know that. <laughs> yeah, try it. It's a, it if in New York, you could do some really cool stuff. Yeah, it's amazing. It's just amazing. But, you know, uh, I, I love the way video cameras have gone over the years. I just wish I had it when I was younger. You know, I always wished in my uh, at one point in my life that I could have a video camera implanted in my head and I could like uh, uh, photograph everything I see, make my own little movies just by looking at them. You know, well, that's pretty much what you can do with the GoPro. Doesn't it feel like the video from a technology standpoint, we're still in flux, things are advancing, we're moving to 4K, so then you need different tools where it seems like on the audio end around 2007, we kind of reached some sort of plateau mm -hmm. where there hasn't really been huge changes. Is that, would that be a correct observation? In, in video? No, in audio. In audio, in audio where we've kind audio's of... Audio's actually, not... actually, technically, audio's gotten worse. Uh, audio, um, uh, we're, we're limited now to this MP3. Most people listen to MP3, and because it, it's, dumbed them, it's dumbed them down, they expect less from sound. Because they listen to MP3s, and they sound fine using earphones, and that's, they're happy with that. But the fact is, it's nowhere as good as a CD. It's nowhere as good as FM radio was, for instance. They'll listen to something like Sirius, which doesn't put out the same signal as an FM station does. But people have dumbed themselves down for audio. You look like you want to say something, Patrick. No, I'm I'm just listening. I I don't have much to contribute on the whole camera thing. So no, with regard to dumbing it down, my dad his cable went out, so yeah. he bought some uh, ra HD rabbit ears. Yeah, and the picture was so much better from getting the you know over the air signal than from Comcast. It was incredible because well, of the well, compression people, people, the cable people, company needs yeah, to people do. People have come to expect less, uh, and in audio especially completely dumbed down and it's it's sad it's really sad you know um well yeah uh bob eberth he just raised his hand an audio shop yeah and we would synchronize uh, an lp with a cd and let people listen to the two and decide which was better and almost every time they would say the lp was better thinking it was the cd Hmm. The LP had a dynamic range that the CD never could uh, never could accomplish. It had a dimensionality too. Yeah, you had a sound stage that you don't get with CDs. Yeah, but see, people don't know that anymore. They get so used to something, it dumbs them down. It's kind of like uh, if you put out a putrid smell in the air. After a while, people get used to it, you know. And then if that putrid yeah. smell isn't there, they 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 feel something's missing. You know. and isn't music now mastered so it can be listened to more universally, especially on small little speakers? Uh, uh, probably. I think they're probably mastered for earphones and headsets than they are for speakers even. I mean, how many people do you go in their house and they're blasting music on their speakers? Nobody. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, Rick, you gotta say <laughs> you got to say something quick. We're about ready to run out of time. we got uh, Jim ready to go up there in Revelstoke. Yeah, he's heading into orbit, I hear. Yeah. Rick? I'm sorry. Yeah, I had, didn't realize I had my sound off. No, I was just agreeing on that as, as far as the fidelity of the... But I guess I'm a nobody because I still listen and blast my speakers at home. Well, good for you. Good for you. Hey, listen, I want to thank all of you. Uh, we've had the full house for most of the night. Patrick, thank you. Bob Eberth out there in Salt Lake City, thank you. Rick Horn, another hotel room, Rick. Charlene <laughs> hasn't said anything, but thank you, Charlene. <laughs> Okay. Josh Wheeler, thank you as always. Mark Thorner, Max, Portland Dave. We'll see you all again hopefully tomorrow night, if not in the next couple of nights. And uh, the next time we do this uh, on video uh, will be on uh, Friday night. And I don't know whether we'll do the whole show or whatever. Maybe it'd be better to start the whole show this way than it just runs itself. Uh, but uh, in any event, uh, thanks, guys, for joining us this evening. Uh, right. And uh, have